All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome. This webinar is being translated into Spanish live. So be sure to choose your language at the bottom of the screen. We're ready to start our webinar now. My name is Miguel Barrios, and I'm a technical services manager for poultry with EW Nutrition. Today, it's my great pleasure to introduce our presenter, Rick Klein. Rick is a nutritionist at Specfeed. He's the founder of the organization and has a master's in poultry nutrition from the University of Natal. Rick subsequently concentrated on poultry nutrition and feeding systems. In addition, he has had experience in the animal feed industry, particularly with regards to least cost feed formulation software. Rick Klein is joined today by our panelist. Ajay, please introduce yourself. Hi, everyone. Thank you very much for joining today's discussion. I'm Dr. Ajay Bhoyer. I'm Global Technical Manager for EW Nutrition. I am working out of US. And uh, I think today's uh, topic is very uh, interesting. You all know that gut health has to play a very crucial role. Uh, if you are, uh, you want to improve the performance or even if you want to reduce the use of antibiotics. Rick is very experienced and well-known uh, nutritionist and uh, we, we hope to enjoy uh, discussion with him. Thank you. Thanks, Ajay. And together we'll help answer questions during and after the presentation. Questions can be asked throughout the webinar in the Q&A panel at the bottom of your screen. Some will receive instant replies from us and some will be picked up and answered in the live discussion that will follow Rick's presentation. At the end of the webinar, we kindly ask you to answer our survey so we can improve our webinars. It'll take less than a minute. Now let's get into it. Rick, you have the floor. Thank you, Miguel. Um... So I'm just making some room on my screen here. Um, today, um, we want to talk about um, poultry nutrition in, in, in a simplistic way, um, because there's a lot of things we can do that are, are simple and effective um, to better manage gut health in, in this era that we live in, and that is the era of antibiotic re um, reduction. And I, I'm sorry that I'm not able to be closer to everybody and be with people. It's, it, it is more difficult doing a presentation when you're talking to a screen. So I hope that I, I keep you engaged and, uh, and you enjoy it. So this uh, management of gut health is, is and, and, and obviously its function, are a key issue in modern broiler production. And it's because it impacts not only on nutrition, but it also impacts on the health of the bird and ultimately the welfare of that bird. Now there's some um, challenges that we are facing as an industry. And the first is we are being encouraged to reduce our use of antibiotics. And the reason for this is people are really concerned about antimicrobial resistance and we'll revisit this in a moment. The other thing that is changing rapidly is consumer perception of the chicken that we produce and obviously consumers eat. And then the last thing, and we're not going to talk about it in, in much detail today, but we are increasingly being put under, uh, quite rightly so, um, pressure to produce um, animal products in a sustainable way. And it's a whole topic on its own, so I'm not going to delve into it now, but it's something we need to bear in mind in, in all steps of the nutrition and production process of, of animal products and poultry in particular. I want to start by just reminding you um, how important this issue of antimicrobial resistance is. And The Economist is probably the world's leading economic paper, or they call themselves a newspaper, but it's a magazine. And when the front page of The Economist talks about antimicrobial resistance, you must know the focus of the world is upon us. So 
what's happened is that the popular press, consumers, and the medical profession have all become really concerned about antimicrobial resistance. And hidden away in a, a, a report by the British government is this little comment that antimicrobial resistance in, in human medicine is primarily through the use of or misuse of antibiotics by people and not by what we do in food producing animals. So it's not as big an issue as, as people would like us to believe. However, regardless of the science, there is increasing pressure on us to reduce the use of antibiotics and other drugs in, in poultry production. And we need to see that as the background to this talk. I want to start um, by, by showing you how um, multifactorial gut health is. And I made this slide just the other day, so it's a bit of an experiment, but um, remember that gut health depends on the bird itself. So it's anatomy and physiology. It depends on the microbiota contained within her gut, and that's both the diversity of the microflora and the number of organisms within that gut. Um, it depends on the feed, the substrates that it contains. Is it a maize-based diet or wheat-based diet? And then obviously the level of feed intake. And then that feed enters into the lumen of the gut and it becomes digester. And that digester should be at the correct pH, have the correct moisture content and contain um, the correct ionic balance. Then we have the external environment and the, the two issues that are particularly important are the bacterial load in that environment and then the stress that those particular birds are under. And then lastly, we have a whole lot of additives that we add to our feed and most of them manipulate the gut uh, microflora or the, indeed the gut itself in some way. Now, all of these things impact on everything else. And I, I've only done two of them just to give you the idea, but I could have had um, six different colors of, of lines across this, this graph just or this diagram just to show you the complexity of, of the gut health issue. And I want to try and give you an overview of nutrition and the gastrointestinal tract in the next few slides. The first is you must remember that the bird and um, the substrate that we feed it, so the feed, and the enzymatic landscape are all dynamic. So they change as the birds age. And this has an impact on, on everything that we do, obviously. The second thing I want to remind you of is that the gastrointestinal tract is a fermentation chamber. And it's exactly the same as if you are fermenting yeast or something else. We need consistency within that chamber. And that is the temperature, the pH must be constant, the, the level of substrates should ideally be the same, and we want a consistent ionic balance. Now within this fermentation chamber exists the gut microflora and they basically um, live with the bird in a commensal relationship. Now every now and again these commensal microflora get angry, they change their gene expression and they start to secrete toxins. And this is the, at the point at which gut health starts to go wrong. Just remember that the gut is the most important route for the entry of antigens into the body. Now these antigens could be food proteins or natural toxins, um, anti-nutritional factors, for example. They could be invading pathogens or indeed some of the gut microbiota can be pathogenic. And that the gut is actually the largest organ of immunity in the body of the chicken. So it's really important in terms of, of, of the immune system as well as absorption and digestion of nutrients. 
Kirk Klassing gives an example that a one kilogram chicken is going to consume about 15 grams of food antigens per day. Um, and that's a staggering amount. Um, so uh, these um, occur in concentrations as small as nanograms per milliliter and as large as grams per kilogram in the case of some of the uh, carbohydrates in soybean, for example. The net result of this is that about 10% of all the nutrients that we feed our chickens in a commercial environment are diverted to maintaining the immune system and dealing with all these antigens. So there are several causes of, of gut health issues. And, and the first one I'm only going to mention once, and that is now, and that is enteric disease. And, and the two that spring to mind are coccidiosis and necrotic enteritis. So these are disorders caused by a specific pathogen, be it an imeria or, or, or a clostridia. Then there are several nutritional or feeding causes. And, and I like to split these out because it helps problem solving when you have an issue. And the first is diuresis and sometimes called polyuria. And, and this is caused by an excess of a nutrient or nutrients and it's excessive urination by the bird. So if you've got too much um, sodium or in fact, too much protein, what actually happens is the bird tries to flush the waste material out of its system via its kidneys, so you get this um, diuresis. Then we get dysbacteriosis, which is caused by an um, excessive or bacterial overgrowth. And this is the one that we tend to think of when we think about a gut health issue. Um, and then we get a physiological um, uh, gut health issue, and that is caused by inflammation, uh, leaky junctions, tight junctions, and then just general endogenous losses, mucin and, and, and sloughed off um, enteric cells. It's really cool when you look at it like this, because it looks like you've got three simple things that happen in isolation. But what happens in practice is they mostly occur together. So you'll see all three elements occurring simultaneously. The key issue about gut health is it starts slowly and then it spirals out of control. So I, I borrowed this idea from uh, van, uh, van Meerhanger from uh, Belgium, and it starts with um, undigested dietary components in the gastrointestinal tract. And what this does is it promotes bacterial overgrowth which we've already said is called dysbacteriosis. The minute you have dysbacteriosis and the secretion of these bacterial toxins, you have shifts in the morphological function of the gut. In other words, you, you may have an increase in inflammation. And what that does is it leads to poor digestibility. And obviously, if you've got poor digestibility, it increases to, uh, leads to an increase in the amount of undigested dietary components. And you can see, uh, if I knew how to do it better, I would have automated this, but what happens is this thing begins to spiral out of control. Um, so it starts slowly and it slowly gets worse and worse and worse. Obviously, the sooner you can resolve the issue, the better. Um, Bailey, who's a scientist with Avigen, um, presented this in a webinar a few weeks ago, and I, I thought it was a really good idea, and said, just remember that when it comes to managing gut health, there are three key components. The first is you want to um, develop the gut in such a way that you don't have a problem. So you want to develop the intestinal tissue, you want to develop the gut microflora, and hopefully you want to develop the immune system. The second thing is you want to prevent a well-developed gut from going bad. So you want to reduce the bacterial load. You want to make sure you have as few anti-nutritional factors as possible. You want to manage the stress of vaccination, heat stress, feed changes, stocking density, or anything like that. And we're going to talk about these in a bit more detail in a moment. And then lastly, you want to maintain 
the gut in a sensible way. So you want a stable mut, uh, gut microflora. You want good gut integrity. You want consistent substrates. All of this will lead to reduced inflammation. Now, again, we have the problem. And the problem is that these three components of managing gut health actually need to occur simultaneously, which makes it uh, fairly tricky. So what I want to do today is talk about, hopefully, some simple solutions uh, that each of us can apply to help us manage what is a really complex situation. And before we talk about gut health, it's absolutely crucial that we know what normal is. And I'm not going to go into, into a lot of detail. I would just remind you that mostly um, the litter content is, is the problem. And we need to know that normal feces contain between 40 and 60 percent moisture uh, uh, water and that litter moisture shouldn't be much more than 30 percent. And that you have complete sequel emptying about two or three times per day. But there are a whole lot of signs of indigestion that you need to be aware of. And the first is, if you have a drop in feed or water intake, you know there's something going on in the gut. Sometimes you will see unusual or poor feathering, that's the next stage. And then you get uneven and poor growth. And um, that's a typical sign that something is going wrong. In some cases, you'll see litter, and or feather eating. This is more typical if you have a deficiency, a nutrient deficiency. Pigment loss can be seen. So you see that uh, the birds just look pale and pasty, not, not healthy. And it's really important when you do um, postmortems to examine the gastrointestinal tract. If you have to read the diarrhea, read the signs, as they say, mostly you're too late. You've missed the problem. And uh, I just want to refer you to this excellent book called exactly that, Reading the Signs of, of Broiler Production. And they've got some excellent examples of some of the things that can go wrong. But as I say, if you're starting to examine the litter of a bird, you've probably missed the key signs that you have a problem developing. So in terms of managing the bird, there are two things that we need to do. And the first is we need to look at the macro structure of the gut. So this is the length of the intestine and gizzard development. And then the second component is we need to focus on the micro structure of the gut. And that's the physiology and, and, and structure of, of the gastrointestinal tract itself. And then what happens in the lumen of the gut. So I'm going to start by um, talking about the macro structure. And I attended a really interesting talk by a veterinarian. Um, and he said, just remember that um, the development of the gut actually begins during incubation. And modern genotypes generate more heat. So the eggs of modern broilers generate more heat. And what this can do is lead to high incubation temperature. And if you overheat these chicks, you have a 13% smaller proventriculus and gizzard and a 16% smaller intestine. This is catastrophic from a, from a gut management point of view. And then we've known for, for several decades now through the work of, of Yale Noy and David Sklan that early access to feed and water stimulates the anatomy and the physiology of the gut of the chicken. It's really important that we have a, a well-functioning gizzard and, and Gonzalo Matios uh, says, just remember the, the gizzard is the conductor of the orchestra. It conducts the conduct of the rest of the gut. So it regulates gut motility. It regulates feed intake. It, if you've got a well-functioning gut, it has enhanced digestive secretions and these, these are, are enzymes and, and hydrochloric acid. Obviously, if they produce more acid, this lower pH um, actually kills many of the pathogens that the birds ingest. And all in all, if you've got a healthy gut, it increases nutrient reactivity, which means that these birds are 
happily, um, well, the, the um, nutrients are happily absorbed. The thing about the gizzard is that it responds rapidly to any change in the diet. Um, and we know um, and the, that if we feed large particles, and particularly um, whole grain, which they do in many parts of Europe, it increases the gets the the size of the gizzard dramatically and has all the positive benefits that we've just talked about. We also know that moderate amounts of the correct type of fiber, and again, the work of Matthias is uh, of real relevance here, and he's shown that fiber that is spear-like, he calls it fusiform, like oat hulls or, or sunflower hulls, have a huge role to play in, in, in enhancing gizzard development. The better um, developed the gizzard is, the less material there is that reaches the seeker. It's interesting, we pellet most of our broiler feed, and many of the things I've just talked about here are of less relevance when we use pelleted diets. And the big thing about this gizzard is we can increase the size by up to double. We can double the size of the gizzard by just feeding them correctly. And if you want to do one single thing that enhances gut health is to make sure you have a healthy gizzard. Just to show you how important it is, this is some work done in Australia by Trong. And they've just got the relative gizzard weight in grams per kilogram. That's relative to the size of the bird. And they were able to measure the AME of these diets. And you can see as the gizzard weight increases, so the AME increases. And if this doesn't illustrate to you how important the gizzard is, nothing will. The other thing that I've, I've come to realize recently is that we can actually do something about the development of the intestine by the way in which we feed these birds. And this is some work conducted in Russia. And what they did is they fed increasing levels of balanced protein for the first 10 days of the bird. And this 11.9 was the uh, Cobb recommendation when this experiment was done. And what I want to show you is that as you increase the protein content of the, of the diet, so the length of the small intestine increases. And I can hear you saying, so what does that matter? Well, here's how it matters. Look, this is the 10 day weight of those birds. And that's obviously significantly different. But look at the 39-day weight of these birds. How whatever we do in the starter period carries over through the life cycle of that bird. Absolutely crucial that we get the intestine to develop properly in the first week. So moving on to the microstructure of the gut. And I want to remind you that we have a lumen. But between the lumen of the gut and the, and the gut lining, the enterocytes, is what we call the unstirred water layer. And this forms the interface between the gut lumen and the mucosa. And it's an absolutely crucial component of intestinal integrity. However, it's really, really fragile, and it's re very easy to damage. And this is the th principal thing that things like coccidiosis damage, is they damage this unstirred water layer. Now, the unstirred water layer is, is more than just moisture. It comprises principally of mucin, and mucin has a protein core, which is three and in rich, and attached to this are oligosaccharides. And I, I, I like to think of it a, a bit like the um, like an umbrella. So we've got the protein handle and then these branched um, oligosaccharides that stick out. The important part about this is the mucin creates a biological sieve. So it allows molecules to pass through, but it precludes the, the bacteria that would have entered into the system. So it's a chemical control method for pathogens. Um, and it's really, really a, a very, very essential part of the, of the gut. Now, the unstirred water layer covers a layer of enterocytes that line the intestine. 
And remember that these are in the form of villi, the lining is in, in the form of villi, and these are in turn covered by microcilii, which are effectively smaller finger-like branches. Now, these enterocytes have a three-day half-life. So every three days, roughly half of them are replaced. And many of these enterocytes are goblet cells, which secrete mucin and enzymes. And interestingly, they reckon that modern broiler breeds have a 50% more intestinal surface area than, um, than legacy breeds. And that in modern broilers, it, the surface area is about the size of four football fields. Uh, so it's, it's an enormous area, which is almost impossible to conceive. Now, obviously, if this if the enterocytes function optimally, they control the permeability of nutrients and obviously keep bad guys, the pathogens, out. Just for interest's sake, the intestinal tissue makes up about 5% of the body weight, so it's quite a small amount. Yet, they use between 15 and 30% of all the oxygen and protein consumed by the bird. So work on a 20%, you're probably about right. Now, importantly, these uh, the protein component are the trophic amino acids, particularly threonine, arginine, and glycine, because these are all um, the, the components of mucin and many of the immunochemicals. Now, the enterocytes have a specific um, energy requirement, and this is only provided by glutamine and butyrate. And we're going to talk about glut um, uh, butyrate in a little while. And uh, it's believed that, not surprisingly, that the gut uses about 20% of all the available energy the bird consumes. So you can see how nutrient hungry the enterocytes and the gut as a whole are. Now between these enterocyte cells are um, tight junctions. And, and these are a fence that block paracellular diffusion, that is movement between the cells. And uh, the cells are joined by junction adhesion molecules. And don't tell me scientists don't have a sense of humor because the abbreviation for that is JAM. So the JAM joins the cells together. Now the problem is that any morphological change within the gut reduces the barrier function. And what happens is you get classical leaky, leaky gut. Now, the minute these cells open up, what happens is you get the translocation um, of luminal antigens. So bacteria can actually enter into the, the bloodstream of the bird. And at the same time, you get a reduction in nutrient uptake. So Leaky gut is really a, a bad thing in terms of, of nutrition and nutrition, nutrient efficiency. The other thing that I didn't realize until I attended a conference in Australia last year is that when the gut opens up, oxygen from the blood system enters the anaerobic gut lumen. And this favors the proteolytic bacteria and the the proteobacteria are the bad guys, the guys we don't want to do. And obviously the, the physical um, ability to control pathogens is reduced. Now, if in our management system we have a, an issue with fasting, so we have a reduced feed intake, be it brought about by poor brooding, changes in feed texture, a long dark out period, thinning, anything like that, any management-induced fasting triggers reverse peristalsis in, in the gut. And what happens is that uric acid moves into the cecum from the cloaca, and that provides a nitrogen source for the clostridia. And then many of the microbes from the cecum are moved back into the intestine, which is the start of the dysbacteriosis process. It also has a direct impact on the tight junctions because these enterocytes are sensitive to both protein and energy restriction. So you have an, an induction of classical le leaky gut. 
sorry. Um, one of the things that can happen to the gut that one needs to be aware of is inflammation. And it's a normal physiological response postprandial, in other words, post eating. Um, so it's got to be there in order for us to digest our food. But what happens is we overwhelm this um, inflammation response with the high levels of energy, protein, and anti nutritional factors that our feed cons consumes. So you get an, an overwhelming inflammatory response. This leads to anorexia and tissue damage. And um, basically, it brings about or mediates malabsorption because it changes the integrity and, inf and function of the epithelium. And it enhances the passage rate. And you know, if you have an increase in passage rate, you have a reduction in nutrient uptake. It's exactly the opposite to what the gizzard does. It slows down the passage rate, so it enhances nutrient uptake. So micronutrient absorption tends to, uh, appears to be the most retarded, so that's the vitamins and minerals. Of the macronutrients, fat uptake is, most, is the most impaired. And what our job as nutritionists is, is to exclude pro-inflammatory substances. And the ones that spring to mind are trypsin inhibitor and soybean meal, and then the phytate that is contained in most um, plant matter. In the old days, we used to use antibiotics to reduce the anti-inflammatory impact in the gut. We no longer have that exit act uh, in our arsenal. So we have to use something else. And the only one that I can find thus far that is really effective is the use of, of butyrate. It is an intense anti-inflammatory. So butyric acid is a health promoting and, um, metabolite. It is anti-inflammatory. Um, Importantly, it promotes the proliferation of epithelial cells and it stimulates the expression of these jam protein molecules. Importantly though, they need to, the butyric acid needs to be delivered in the, in the small intestine. Um, so some form of coating is required to protect it going through the um, proventriculus and gizzard. Um, the other thing you can do is to stimulate um, the butyric acid producing bacteria using pro and prebiotics and this uh, looks to be really promising um, and there's early days but the technology is looking really interesting. Um, I just want to talk briefly about the microbiota and, and just remind you that um, the bird begins life with a very limited microbiota. We used to say it was sterile but we now know this is not the, the case. And in the in normal farmyard situation, the breeder hen transfers her microbiota to the chick. We've prevented that from happening, so we are dependent upon horizontal transmission from the environment of the hatchery into the bird. The key issue here is that the early population sets the stage for the lifetime of the, of gut health. So. Uh, this hasn't got much to do with nutrition. It has everything to do with management in the early lifestyle of the bird. Just remember that the gut comprises different compartments and each of these has unique physiochemical characteristics. In other words, we've got different fermentation chambers within a large fermentation. And generally what happens is the number and diversity of bacteria increase towards the distal end, in other words, the cecum of the, of the gut. And there's a hundred fold more bacteria in the seeker than there are in the crop. Generally speaking, diverse populations tend to be more healthy. Now, from a nutritional point of view, we can play a role here because any protein that bypasses the small intestine can have an impact on the microbiota. And this protein can originate from resistant or surplus protein. There's some protein that the bird just simply cannot digest. It could be microbial in origin. It could be endogenous. Um, so inflammatory materials, some, something like mucus. And uh, 
and it can, could be caused by in, the intestinal damage that coccidiosis and necrotic enterosis cause. The problem with all of this surplus protein is it is fermented in the cecum and these bacteria produce harmful metabolites. And this is effectively the start of the whole dysbacteriosis cycle. So we need to feed this bird to prevent this from happening. And I would remind you that the chick has a, di a diminished ability to digest its diet. So whatever we do, we have to feed, especially in the first 10 days, excellent feed quality. We want a high biological quality, so no taste, no smell, no moisture. We want properly processed protein sources. We want high quality soybean meal. We don't want over-processed animal byproducts. Um, our grain should be free of broken broken kernels, moles and mycotoxins. Generally speaking, our diet must be of the correct texture. But I want to say this to you, all of you that are listening today. However good you think you are at this particular aspect, you have to do better because it is the key to successful gut health and gut development in the broiler chicken. We know that some ingredients are preferable Maize tends to be better in baby birds than wheat. We've already discussed the fact that you want to maintain a consistent environment. And I want to tell you, you've got to go out of your way to avoid variable ingredients and or ingredient supplies. And as I've said, in the aim of in, in maintaining a consistent environment, you must use the same ingredients in all phases. I want to talk a little bit about feed additives um, just to, to round off and finish off my talk today. Um, and I want to remind you that we need to find or use additives that do one of two things. They either replace the antibiotics that we've always used or they enhance the gut health in their own right. And, and generally speaking, we need to, to choose on both of these. Our um, additives mostly modify the gut microbiota in some way. And this would include things like the probiotics, prebiotics, uh, phytogenic chemicals, and then obviously the enzymes. Some additives actually modify the enterocytes. And these would include compounds like betaine, enzymes, uh, volatile fatty acids. I didn't skip nucleotides on purpose. We know that they're really, really effective. They're just very expensive at the moment. Um, but these are an exciting uh, chemical for the future. Just remember that we are trying to replace the, uh, the um, antibiotics. And the problem is that we still, after four decades of using them, don't fully understand the mode of action that our old-fashioned antibiotic growth promoters had. And what we do know, that if we want to replace them, we need an integrated solution. So no single um, compound is likely to replace zinc bacitracin, for example. The trouble is that when we test these additives, and this includes zinc bacitracin, the results tend to be inconsistent. And there's a very simple reason for this, is that they don't work if they're not needed. So if you test any additive in a clean environment, often you're not going to see a result. The reason, the another reason why things tend to be difficult to prove is that we never quite sure what our starting point is. Often we have a very poor idea of what substrates we've got, and more importantly, we don't know what the microbiota in that bird looks like. So it's kind of difficult to choose additives if you don't know these two key issues. Just um, a word on, on probiotics. Remember uh, that in the US, they call them direct fed microbials. And I'm, personally, I think this is a much better way of describing them. These are live microorganisms. And the ones that are most widely used are the lactobacilli and bacilli. Um, the bacilli have the advantage that you can use the spores. So they extensively use these spores are, are heat stable. They 
lived through the pelleting process. Um, and once they in the in the bird, they become vegetative and replicate. And these bacillus, which are most of the uh, of the probiotics are bacillus species, uh, colonize the mu the mucosa. The advantage of this is that they stimulate the immune function, and they competitively exclude bad bacteria. So what happens is you cause a disease resistance without pathogenicity. Many of these um, uh, probiotics secrete digestive enzymes as well. So they actually enhance digestibility. And these can be proteases, xylanases, or even lipases. The prebiotics are materials that we feed to the bird that the bird can't utilize, and they directly stimulate the bacterial species. Now, I'm going to use whey powder, not that many people do it, but because whey powder is lactose, milk sugar. The chicken has no lactase enzyme, but we are feeding lactobacilli, and they absolutely love lactose. So it's a really good example of how a, pro, a prebiotic works. There are a wide range of non-digestible oligosaccharides, the mannan oligosaccharides and fructo oligosaccharides, and they're widely used and they're all very effective. I think that um, Moore, who's an Australian, who points out that actually it's a combination of pre and probiotics that will stimulate flocks to have a more uniform microbiota. Um, plant extracts, um, which we call phytogenic products, they are essentially um, oils extracted from plants, be that the flowers, the leaves, the roots, or even the fruit. And each of these compounds has a specific mechanism, and it has been difficult to elucidate these, and there are many of them. We do know that many of them have antibacterial properties, so they help reduce the pathogen load. And they can, in fact, improve the microbial composition and the metabolic function of that microbiota. Many of them are powerful antioxidants in their own right. And we also know that they can support the host immune system. The net result of phytogenic use is that you have a reduction in inflammation, you can support these tight junctions, and you can enhance nutrient uptake. What I want to say to you is that our understanding of these phytogenic products is developing rapidly. And three years ago, uh, in the all tech survey, people were um, saying, oh, they're not sure about phytogenic products. And now when you see commercial nutritionists being interviewed, this is the area that they are the most interested in. And I think it, it goes hand in hand with our increase in understanding. Just remember that um, these essential oils are extracted from the plant and in the unpurified form, they have a mix of different phytomolecules. And I think this is probably where the lack of understanding um, starts is that if you've got a mixture of products, you don't know what's going on. So what you need to do is clearly define the active compound to standardize this compound, and then you can start making sense of it. An example of this is oregano, the essential oil of that, and, and the oil itself is a mixture of various phytomolecules. Basically, they call terpenoids. But within that, we know we have specific compounds that have specific activities. So thymol is an example of that. So what is actually happening is we're getting a much better understanding of these phytogenic molecules and, and, and they're looking very promising. I just want to remind you that it is not essential that phytomolecules be essential oils. They can be other molecules from within a plant. I think that um, enzymes are probably uh, the most significant additive that we have for many reasons. The first is they inactivate um, anti-nutrients, and we've already talked about trypsin inhibitor, 
but also phytate we know is a potent anti-nutrient. Things like beta mannanes, uh, all beta mannanes, all of these are, are really anti-nutritional in the chicken. We know that because they enhance digestibility, they deprive the microbiota of the seeker of nutrients, so they prevent dysbacteria from, from starting. We know that they can modify gut structure, they can change bacterial species um, dist um, distribution, and they can even have a prebiotic effect. Enzymes are a talk on their own, but don't forget about them, they're really important. So I wanna end off by giving you some key take home messages. And the first thing is I want to say is gut health is complicated, but all you need is a simplistic, holistic approach. You don't need rocket science, you just need common sense. So the first thing you need to do is make sure that you achieve early intake of quality diets. Absolutely crucial for gut health. The earlier you can seed the microbiota with beneficial bacteria, the better. Obviously, you need to control internal parasites, which is beyond what we talked about today. Importantly, within the gut, you want to try and reduce the levels of fermentable protein. Because the minute the, the bacteria and the cecum start fermenting protein, your problems start. You want to avoid fasting. You want to avoid restricting feed intake in any way. It's important that we manage inflammation and the tight junctions in, of, of, the, in, the, in of the gut lining. We need to avoid sudden dietary changes. And I see far too many nutritionists who don't use poultry byproduct meal in the starter because they're worried about the quality, but they whack it into the finisher. And then, you know, the gut microflora have got no chance of dealing with that. They've never seen an animal protein before. We must aspire to negligible levels of anti-nutritional factors. And that simply involves using perfectly cooked soybean meal, for example. We want to maintain a consistent gut chemistry. Don't mess your dietary cation and anion balance around. That messes up your microflora. And you want to select your additives judiciously. I'm of the firm belief that you can only prevent gut health issues. Seldom are you able to fix them. So the sooner you can identify the problem, the sooner you can intervene and prevent it from getting worse, the better. So you need to recognize them early. We know very little about managing gut health. We have much to learn. But if we apply some of the simple things that we already know, we can make a huge difference. And with that, we are done and I'm going to stop sharing my screen so that we can deal um, with questions and answers. Obviously, I, I haven't had a chance to look at the question panel because I've been doing other things, um, but I welcome your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rick. Now we'll move on to the Q&A session. So if you have any questions, you can type them in our Q&A panel at the bottom of your screen. Okay, can I, can I maybe start with um, some of the questions and answers? Of course. Um, what, what is the, the important cause of a reduction in gizzard size? Um, it, it's really very simple, fine particles. If you've got fine particles, um, you, you, you create an issue. Um, now, um, the problem is when we feed pelleted diets to chickens, we mill the particles fine, uh, specifically so that we can make decent pellets. So it's always a, a, a playoff between the fineness of the grind and pellet quality. Um, and generally speaking, it doesn't matter how good the pellet is, because the minute the pellet hits the gizzard, it's one squeeze and it's paste. So it, it has no structure. So 
So you want to try and avoid that. And, and what actually works really well in pellets is to feed a, a coarse fiber source um, along with it. And, and we feed sunflower meal uh, from day one in broiler chickens in my country because that gives us the best result. It's that coarse fiber that causes the gizzard to develop properly. Um, this next question uh, um, is, since the development of the gut uh, started during the hatching period, um, is there any opportunity to recover once the bird arrives on the farm? And I would think the answer to that question is probably minimal. Um, you could probably feed them a better quality protein diet and that might have a small effect but if you are reducing your gut length by 16 percent i don't think there's any coming back from that so good chick quality is really important to good gut health um, is there anybody who um, has a, a verbal question they want to ask There's a question here about in over nutrition um, during egg incubation, and that has shown promising results in the development of the, the gastrointestinal tract. That is true. Um, uh, I want to say this is an exciting technology, um, and, and we know that we can stimulate gut development at this early stage. It is, however, quite difficult to apply in practice, which is why it probably hasn't been adopted as widely as one would have expected it to have been adopted. Okay. Right um, from the Spanish section, we have, uh, what about any experiences with bacteriophages? Also, uh, what about any uh, resistance, bacterial resistance to phytogenics? Uh, it, it, two things I, I know I've read about, but I'm, I'm no expert at. And bacteriophages, I, uh, what I've read and the talks that I've attended, I think that this is a technology that holds um, real promise for our industry in the long term. I can't see it as a short-term solution. Um, and, and even medium term, we're a long way from, because you need to have a bacteriophage that attacks a specific bacteria or a specific class of bacteria. So the, it does work, um, but we way, way, way off this being applied in practice. Um, the next thing is, is do bacteria develop resistance to um, phytogenic molecules? And, and uh, AJ, you may um, uh, want to help me on this particular one. I would think that all bacteria are likely to develop some degree of resistance to all molecules. After all, that is what happens with natural mutation and progression. So it is likely that you will get some degree of, of resistance over a period of time. Um, but AJ, um, perhaps you can chip in there and, and help me. Yeah, so if we look into the way the phytomolecules exerts the antibacterial or let's say bacteriostatic activity, the way the concentration of phytomolecule is designed in the in a particular product. So this antibacterial or bacteriostatic activity, we need to understand the mechanism of quorum sensing and quorum quenching. So basically the phytomolecules what they do is they interfere or breaks the communication within the bacterial population. And this communication is very important because based on that, the, the bacteria, they communicate with each other, whether to increase the, their population and virulence or to reduce it. And that's the way I think we need to understand that they generally do not kill the bacteria and uh, they miss in the, in the concentration they are in phytomolecules but they they break the communication which happens externally 
so there are very less chances that uh, they quickly develop the resistance so so a bit like antibiotic you are uh, not antibiotic disinfectant you can use the same disinfectant for generations and exactly. they continue to work okay exactly thank you for clarifying that all right another question that came up here is there has been now new development in the form of cage free poultry farming systems but is this method good in containing the poultry diseases? And in general, from uh, talking with clients in the layer industry, there has certainly been a comeback of diseases that were of the quote unquote old world. So they're seeing a lot of yeah. parasites uh, yeah. from one. Um, one big one that's come back is blackhead disease, for instance. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so is it the best at containing diseases? Definitely not. That's why we moved to caging systems in the first yeah. place. Right? Yeah, but, I rest my case. Yeah. yeah, the reality is that that's what the customer is asking for. Now we're going to all these alternative housing systems, so we're going to have to find a way to deal with them. Which leads into the second question of probiotics helping with that setup. And yeah, um, as Rick mentioned in his presentation, this is a multifactorial issue, right? And probiotics is just one part of that tool set. Look, I, I, I'm, I'm a little um, uh, unfamiliar with these cage-free um, production systems because uh, I actually attended the poultry science meeting uh, last week on this on the layer session, and and if you didn't, I would advise you to to get access to it some way. It's still online. Um, it was great, um, and yeah, the, these these factors were mentioned. Um, and, but one of the things I said: remember that if if human human welfare in a country is not great, you mustn't expect them to worry about animal welfare and and my country we we're still worrying about human welfare as as they are in india and and in many other countries of the world so we we're a bit behind so i haven't had experience of these systems i have however had experience in in broiler breeders and and we are using probiotics and and to a lesser extent prebiotics in broiler breeders quite widely because what what has been found is that if you if you use the probiotics and the prebiotics in the breeder hen, there is a degree of that activity passed on to the chick. So this is quite a widely used practice now. And, and, and I can't see why um, uh, that's not going to work. The other thing is that there are a lot of phytogenic molecules that have been shown and demonstrated to enhance liver function, for example, and particularly in long life layers, that's really, really important. So I, I think as we, as we start to understand, I think the thing is we've got to isolate these phytogenic molecules first. Once we've done that, we can start to understand their mode of action. And this is the, 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 the area that EW are involved in. They, they, they're starting to really understand how the, the different phytogenic molecules work. And I think that in five years' time when we have this discussion, people are going to tell you use this particular product for that particular problem. Um, at the moment, we're just hoping that we can prevent bad liver, bad liver damage and, and, and using a phytogenic product to do that. Uh, I may be waffling. Uh, AJ, maybe you can help me. Yeah, you're right. I think uh, you rightly mentioned that even after using for 40 years the antibiotic growth promoters we still don't know how it works we, we don't we still don't know so no. i mean to say we know little but not the everything that we know and no. uh, this is a evolving science and uh, we hope to have um, many many researchers will come up with the with many uh, different aspects the way phytogenic cells so rick one more question uh, i think uh, there are a couple of questions on the gizzard size and its influence, and you spoke at length on that. So can you, can you tell the audience or uh, the nutritionist sitting that what exactly they can do one, two, three to improve the gizzard function practically? Well, there are many things, and, and many people do different things in different parts of the world. Um, in, in, in Europe, um, they add whole wheat um, to the diet. 
and, and they do that in Australia as well. And, and importantly, they do not mill the wheat and they do not include it into the pellet. So what they do is post pelleting, they mix in 5% minimum of whole wheat. And that is a very, very effective way of stimulating um, gizzard size. Now, in many countries, we don't have wheat and we don't have that option. And it doesn't appear to work that well with maize. Um, if you use corn, something to do with a color, if you put corn in with the pellets, the big birds eat all the corn and the, bird, the, the small birds don't get any. There's selective feeding that, that, that uh, derails that process, let's call it that. So the, the other option that we have is obviously you want to, to have a coarser grist in your hammer mill or your roller mill before you make pellets. The drawback of that is that if your grist is too coarse, it's really difficult to make quality pellets. So you have a reduction in feed intake and that's a much bigger problem than a poor gizzard. So generally speaking, we tend to have um, a grist that is too fine for our broilers because we want better pellet quality. The only thing that you can effectively do to overcome that is to increase some fusiform, include some fusiform fiber in the pelleting, in, in, the, in the formulation. Um, sunflower oil cake is an excellent source of fusiform fiber. Otals is another good source. Um, they, the, um, Ming and Chok in Australia has just published some work where they used sugarcane um, bagasse, which is also fusiform. So you want a fusiform source of fiber. Um, and interestingly enough, you need about 2.5% in the diet. 2.5% gives you a, a, a significant improvement in nutrient utilization. 5% starts to retard nutrient utilization. So you need some fiber, but not too much. About 2.5% is about the right level. Thank you, Rick. All right, so we're due to end the webinar very soon. So we'll answer maybe two more questions and uh, we'll move on to the very end. I'll go ahead and take one because it's right up my alley. What strategy would you recommend to prevent blackhead from competitive exclusion standpoint, considering you have low to intermediate blackhead challenge? I, I, you can answer that as well, Miguel. <laughs> Still, a lot of unknowns around histomonosis. Uh, research is ongoing. I know Dr. Beck said is one of, uh, of the ones looking at it right now. But you got to think about where histomonas enters the bird, right? It eats it. There are some cecal droppings that are uh, taken up through cecal drinking. But histomonosis is going to thrive in the cecal, right? So if you're thinking of competitive exclusion, then we're going to have to. Uh, grow the bacteria or allow those bacteria in the cecal to thrive so histomonas may stay away. It could be a potential strategy, but again, there's been limited research on competitive exclusion with histomonas. So uh, the best way is still to be found as far as I'm concerned. Mm. Yeah, I didn't realize it's not a disease I'm familiar with at all. And, and I didn't realize that it was actually a sequel, uh, sequel in infection, which makes it really tricky, doesn't it? Right. Yeah. There's a, a question here, um, whether we should add multivitamins in the feed or the water. Um, I would say to you, generally speaking, uh, you want to have adequate levels of multivitamins in the feed. And uh, personally, I use considerably higher levels than are recommended um, by DSM or the breeding companies in the starter. About I use about 20% more just because the bird is eating so little. What I do tend to do is I use slightly less in the finisher. So overall, my vitamin cost is probably slightly lower than average but I've got much, I've got a different stacking of them. That doesn't give you that little boost of vitamins that you need when you hit a stress situation. And that's where waterborne 
uh, vitamins work really well. So if you are about to vaccinate birds, or you know you're going to have a heat stress situation because you've been watching the long-term weather forecast or, or something like that, that is the time to use multivitamins in the water as a, an on-top booster, but not on an ongoing basis on a daily, on a daily basis. That's just expensive and difficult to manage. And remember that these, you put these organic matter um, chemicals in the water, all you do is you create a, a toxic soup in your drinker system as well. So you've got to be a little careful of that. Okay. There are still questions unanswered in the Q&A box. I apologize for not being able to deal with all of them during the session. However, we'll be more than happy to pick up our conversation via email. If you write to webinar at ewnutrition.com, all questions will be routed to us. Also, this webinar will be made available on our website tomorrow. You can also join us in our next sessions, which you can find online. Don't forget that our survey is coming up right away. Thank you for attending and for your questions. Stay safe and bye for now. And thank you to everybody, whoever you are and wherever you are in the world. I see we've got Pakistan and India, and it's really good to see everybody here. Thank you very much, thank you, Andre, today. Uh, we have bye enjoyed bye, a lot of your talk. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye, Miguel. Bye-bye.